Well, hello there. Thank you for joining me for this week's edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook, and we're touching on municipal, provincial, and federal politics this week. But we begin this edition of Telil 24-7 with an apology. Incorrect information went out on last week's show concerning the Richmond Municipal Council vote on whether District 2 Councillor Michael Digden was considered to be in a breach of the Municipal Code of Conduct as a result of text messages he had sent in March of 2021. Specifically, we incorrectly reported the vote breakdown in terms of whether Councillor Digden had been considered to be in breach. I had originally reported that the vote was 3-1 to one against a breach request and that the only councillor that voted in favour of this action being in a breach was District 5 councillor Brent Sampson. As a matter of fact, the vote was 2-2. It was defeated because no 2-2 tie vote can ever go forward as a win in municipal politics. The other councillor that had voted along with councillor Sampson in terms of it being a breach was Deputy Warden and District 3 Councillor Melanie Sampson. So I do apologize for this misinformation. The result does remain the same. Council did not vote in favour of that action being a breach from District 2 Councillor Michael Digden. So we move on to this week's show. Among the municipal issues we'll be looking at are whether Port Hawkesbury Town Council increased its tax rates when passing its latest municipal budget. We'll tell you more about what's going on with the survey process for the Destination Reeve Street initiative. And you're going to hear what one Richmond councillor has to say about whether cell phones should be allowed in the council chambers. But we begin this week by taking a look at an update at a story we brought you a couple of times right here on Telil 24-7. Specifically, whether measures in the latest provincial budget aimed at non-resident property owners in Nova Scotia are fair and should go forward. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, Premier Tim Houston announced that while a D-transfer tax would remain in place, the property tax increases for non-resident property owners would be scrapped. Here is how Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett responded to that decision by Premier Houston at the latest Committee of the Whole meeting for Richmond Municipal Council. She's participating virtually, but you'll still be able to hear what Warden Mumberkett had to say. Take a listen. Premier Houston reversed the province's decision to proceed with the 2% per $100 assessment property tax for non-residents of Nova Scotia. And so, you know, that tax would have had far-reaching impacts on local businesses and communities. Seasonal residents contribute greatly to our rural communities and economies. You know, we know this to be true. Um, There were comparisons to other property tax structures in other areas of the country, but the sheer amount and the processes that were being proposed here were not the same at all. Um, You know, there was a lot of concern that a clear message had been sent that Nova Scotia's welcome that was officially rolled up. Um, The funding, you know, that was going to be collected was not earmarked specifically to address the housing crisis and and was not earmarked to be reinvested in the municipalities from which it was collected, which is a major concern, I think. Um, And also, you know, many of the properties that would be most impacted just would not align with the province's attainable housing goals. You know, particularly when you consider affordable housing and you need to locate it near food, you know, food, fuel and pharmacies. A lot of of these properties are, 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 you know, more rural in nature. Um, lots of concern around ancestral homes, you know, when a far-flung family members return year after year being put at risk. And also, you know, I guess my main concern was the property tax room that would have been lost to municipalities that are already facing skyrocketing costs, you know, because it's this property tax is kind of the purview of municipalities. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, this was a matter of principle. Um, the decision was made to go ahead without us being consulted and without any direct financial benefit to us. In fact, with negative consequences. Um, and so I guess at this time, I would like to suggest that we amend the motion of April 25th to write a letter to Premier Houston, instead of protesting the tax, instead to provide a note of thanks for his willingness to listen to the feedback provided by this council, many other councils, and the many people who communicated the unintended and devastating consequences this could have on our rural economies in particular. Um, and, you know, although the, the letter originally wasn't written, we just passed the motion to do that, I certainly... You know, right after the council meeting last time, reached out to our MLA and asked him to communicate to the premier that the letter was forthcoming. Um, and it just turns out that um, the decision was reversed before then. So, so I guess I would make, um, and I might need a little help on the wording because I don't have my Robert's Rules book, book with me, but um, I guess it would be to amend the motion of April 25th to write a letter 
uh, to Premier Houston protesting the tax and instead provide a note of thanks for his willingness to listen to the feedback. The motion originally was uh, just, uh, you know, a letter to be written to by a warden, by yourself, to Tim Houston, and it went through all the other members, which I think is needs to not be changed. <coughs> and it would only be the back end of the motion, which is talking about regarding the proposed non-resident property, provincial property tax, and the proposed non-resident deed transfer tax. So I think that's still applicable. Uh, announced as part of the budget, indicating the municipality of Richmond's opposition to this initiative. So I think your motion would say that, that we adjust the motion to replace the indicating the municipality of, the Rich, of Richmond County's opposition to the initiative to instead say to thank them for listening to the concerns of, of the residents. Um, but, but I guess my question would be, Warden, where do we stand with the um, with the deed transfer tax? Like, are we still, what is your feeling in terms of our opposition to that? Or are we just looking to provide a, a note of concern, regard, uh, a note of thanks for listening? Yeah, I think, you know, I think with the deed transfer tax, um, given the fact that the property tax has been completely removed, I, I feel like my feeling is that it's an acceptable compromise. It's uh, not ideal again. But it, we, I think we do need to note the principle of not being consulted, right? And so um, so I, I guess I would not be, you know, necessarily protesting it at this point, but I certainly would be noting uh, the need to consult municipalities in it. So I don't know that I would really make any changes to that piece. This is what I'm hearing, uh, that we're looking to um, move that we amend a previously approved motion, which was approved on uh, April the 25th, 2022. Uh, and that we want to amend the part that reads uh, indicating the municipality of Richmond County's opposition to this initiative and changing it to indicate that we would like to, this is where I'll let you say your part. And yeah. it, well, I guess it, to change it to thanking the Premier for listening to the concerns of municipalities and Nova Scotians and um, and just, you know, expressing, but continuing to express our concern about consultation going forward. Warden Mumberkett's motion to amend the previous motion regarding a letter to government officials about non-resident property owners received unanimous approval at the May 9th Committee of the Whole Meeting for Richmond Council held at the Richmond Municipal Building in Arishat. Richmond Municipal Council wasn't the only local municipality that was busy last week. As a matter of fact, Port Hawkesbury Town Councillors voted unanimously to pass their latest budget for the 2022-23 fiscal year. Does that budget include tax increases? Well, if you live in Port Hawkesbury, you might be used to no tax increases happening. As a matter of fact, the residential rate hasn't gone up since 1987. And that was the case once again this year, with the residential rate holding steady at $1.80 per $100 of assessment, and the commercial rate staying put at $4.16 per $100 of assessment. After the town council meeting where these budget changes happened, I caught up with the CAO for Port Hawkesbury, Terry Doyle, and the director of finance for the town, Aaron McKechn, who presented the budget overview before it went to a vote last week at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center. We'll hear from them in just a moment, but first, here's a little background. In making her pre-budget address to Port Hawkesbury Town Council's latest regular meeting, the town's director of finance, Aaron McKechn, pointed out that at one point in the budget talks, Port Hawkesbury faced a $236,000 shortfall for the coming year. So after the meeting, I asked her what challenges the town faced in terms of keeping its budget balanced this time around, and what did council have to do to make that happen? Yeah, policing costs obviously across the province are up quite significantly. So that was a significant pressure this year that we faced. Also, I mean, just general expenses. Everything is, is increasing. Um, fuel costs, we have a number of vehicles um, on the roads that are, are providing essential service, um, power rates, everything Everything seems to increase. But the most notable, um, other than your kind of general regular increases due to inflation, um, our most notable and uh, significant 
increase would have been around our, our policing costs. There were some internal reductions. I, I think everybody um, looked at their departmental budgets and tried to make some or try to see some efficiency. So we decided to reduce, you know, uh, across all departments, some travel and professional development and, um, you know, material supplies, office expenses, just smaller, smaller areas. Um, but that didn't um, cover the entire um, uh, increase in, in expenditure. Uh, so we did, uh, we are looking to uh, improve upon some of our revenues. So uh, we had a really successful day camp last year, which we think we can improve upon. So we were able to garner a little more revenue, we think, from that this coming year, uh, as well as looking to um, improve upon the access to our arena and um, looking at um, you know, selling a little bit more ice this year. Um, so we, we were able to uh, soften um, the impact on reserves a little bit through some revenue growth as well. Um, but we did have to pull uh, just over $150,000 from our reserve. Uh, we didn't uh, think this was the year to, you know, make any significant reductions to uh, services. Um, you know, that, that may happen in future years, but um, we're, we're hoping and, and seeing some positive trends around our assessment and growth in our assessment, and we're hoping that will continue. Um, so, uh, you know, we did pull a little bit of money from, from our savings uh, to balance and, um, yeah, and wanting to provide the same levels of service to the citizens um, as they've had. With McKechn speaking positively about recreation programs available throughout this spring and summer, I asked her if she felt that the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions across Nova Scotia on March 21st and the potential for rentals of town properties like the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre to increase dramatically over the coming year would have an impact on next year's budget prospects. I think people are really excited to kind of get back out and return to somewhat normalcy around the conference side of things as well as the ticket events so uh, you know we had a couple of events here on the weekend uh, ticketed events that I think were, were successful I think we're seeing a uh, return to the facility on the conference side um, I don't I don't think it's it's a little too early to, to say if that's going to continue and continue to um, be over and above where we've seen things in previous years prior to pandemic um, time will tell um, but we are, you know, we are seeing that return, which is really great. It's nice to see people in the facility. It's nice to see people out and about. It's nice to see people, um, you know, getting back into the community. And, um, yeah, we're, we're hoping that, um, you know, that will continue into, into next year. That optimism is also felt by Port Hawkesbury's Chief Administrative Officer, Terry Doyle. During last week's regular council meeting in the run-up to the budget's introduction, Doyle confirmed that the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre is booked for several concerts and other public events well into December. In the meantime, the town's budget also includes an aggressive capital spending plan for the coming months, including work on town streets and active transportation projects slated to lead to the Port Hawkesbury Community Park and Granville Street, connecting to the new Sunset Park at the intersections of Granville and Prince Street. So a uh, very conscious decision uh, to, to invest uh, heavily in capital in, in this year. I think there was an opportunity uh, that we could move forward with some, with some essential work uh, that's, that had been planned for quite some time. Active transportation uh, in this town has been a, been a priority for council uh, for, for a number of years, starting with uh, Destination Reeve Street and then continuing. Uh, we're going to see some, some great improvements on that side. Uh, as we indicated earlier, that's the, the active transportation lane that will connect uh, our, our playground. Um, and uh, as well, uh, we're working finalizing design now on the on active transportation on the waterfront. And so that's going to see a replacement of our, our boardwalk, uh, which, which really needs that, uh, that, for that to happen because of safety concerns, and, I, and for beautification around that. And so a number of very positive things happening right on the, on the waterfront as well. Uh, accessibility improvements, asphalt improvements down there, um, beautification, streetscaping, placemaking, uh, those types of things, a change in, in the activity level that's going to happen as a result of kiosks and, and a loan program for non-motorized watercraft and, and, and bicycles. Um, large improvements in Sunset Park, we're going to see that, that field turn into, um, we think, uh, a big attraction in the town of Port Hawkesbury. 
According to CAO Doyle, these improvements are all coming this summer because the town split its budgeting process for 2022-23. So we approved our capital budget first. So pile of work that happens much earlier than we would normally approach the budget process. That allowed us to, to move forward with, the, with, with our capital plan. Uh, and uh, it's been, that's been very positive. But it also takes some work off the operating side. So uh, when we look at operating budget, uh, we're, we're looking at those operating costs and, and revenues that support that independent of capital. So that was, a, that was a really good process to go through. I do appreciate Council's work on this. They appreciated the, the challenges, um, really hard questions asked. There's uh, lots of discussion and compromises, as there has to be. And, uh, and some really good suggestions, and, and uh, we're, we're very happy with the process. The new Port Hawkesbury budget passed unanimously at last week's council meeting, with very little discussion following McKechn's presentation of the budget particulars. However, the Director of Finance wants to make it clear that this was a budget of compromise, and she applauded town councillors and staff, as well as Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton, for working together to be able to present the document for the coming year. I think there's always some bruises through your budget process. I don't think anything goes unscathed, but I think um, what's really nice about um, working with council and staff is that kind of when we um, when we make a decision, you make the decision entirely, and it was nice to have that unanimous vote. And, and yeah, believe me, there was lots of, of conversations throughout the budget process, but I think we provide enough time and enough information in advance uh, for council um, that they can ask their questions, and we, we have as many meetings as we require in order to get to kind of a final um, plan that everybody is is maybe not entirely happy with but can live with. So um, I think that's the way this council has has approached the budgeting process and the way that we've approached the budgeting process. So um, it's worked it's worked well and it looks it looks good. During her budget address to town council, McKechn noted that Port Hawkesbury's residential tax rate hasn't changed since 1987. However, while this year's budget was able to proceed without raising taxes or cutting services, while making financial commitments to capital spending such as roads and active transportation, McKechn warned that the balancing act may get even more difficult over the coming 12 months with inflation spiking and fuel prices taking a sharp rise. With inflation being so high, um, uh, you know, that's going to impact a lot of things. Um, so, uh, you know, we're hoping and that um, that will settle down, but we don't we don't know that. So we don't want to be seeing, you know, 40 percent increases in fuel prices over prior year, uh, which is kind of what we've been been seeing as of late. Um, but nothing, I, I think we're kind of in a hopeful state right now. Um, you know, we were in a significant kind of revenue loss position in the last couple of years with the uh, COVID-19 restrictions. There's nothing really that is significant that we're anticipating. We're hoping our assessments are going to continue to grow. We're hoping that, you know, people want to do business here in this community. We're hoping that people continue to want to come to this facility um, and use our recreation facilities and whatnot. Um, but nothing, nothing to significantly note at this point in time. If you watched last week's edition of Tell Hill 24-7, you might remember that I interviewed the head of Nova Scotia's Federal Boundaries Commission, Supreme Court Justice Cindy Bourgeois, about changes that are coming to ridings across the province, including potential changes to the riding of Cape Breton Canso, which could take in the town and county of Antigonish and become Cape Breton Antigonish. What does the sitting MP have to say about all of that? Well, to get the answers, I caught up with our Member of Parliament for Cape Breton Council, Mike Kellaway, earlier this week. And you might be interested to know that he has some perspective on what leads to boundary changes, given that before he entered federal politics in 2019, Kellaway served as one of the commissioners for Nova Scotia's Provincial Boundaries Commission, which led to some changes here in Richmond County and around the province during the last provincial election. Here's Mike Kellaway sharing his thoughts on the whole issue right now. So by now you've probably had a chance to take a look at the proposed redrawing of the federal ridings in Nova Scotia, including your own Cape Breton Canso. At first blush, what was your immediate reaction to the report and the idea of realigning Cape Breton Canso to become the proposed riding of Cape Breton Antigonish? What were your thoughts there? 
Well, my first reaction, Adam, was uh, uh, a large uh, riding just got larger, geographically speaking. Um, but also, um, you know, I, I relish the opportunity if the uh, commission decides so uh, to, to 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 solidify their, their 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 first series of recommendations to uh, serve the people of the town of Antigonish, as I have done uh, many in the municipality in the county of Antigonish. And uh, uh, I look at the riding and uh, the addition of the town uh, of Antigonish is the major change. Uh, for the most part, the riding remains the same, but look, it adds um, a significant population base. It adds a, a geographic base. But I've heard uh, from um, quite a few people, Adam, um, so far uh, through email pri primarily, but some calls are, uh, you know, people in Cape Breton uh, concerned that, uh, which is a nice thing. I received a couple of calls from Richmond County and, uh, okay. and, uh, and Inverness County saying, are we going to lose you as our representative? I've had uh, 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 calls and emails from from folks in the town of Antigonish, you know, saying that, you know, we as a community of interest have more in common with Pictou County than we do Cape Breton. So I think this is an opportunity. And having sat on the last provincial uh, electoral boundaries commission, uh, I can tell you that, um, at least from our perspective, I and mean, I assume for the federal perspective, is that the sessions that are going to take place, I think five or six of them across the province, we did anyway, as a provincial body, listened. And there were some really great examples uh, in East Hans. We were going to go a particular way, and there was a, uh, uh, a groundswell of support, community support, that suggested another way. And we kind of uh, uh, followed their recommendations. So what I would encourage is that if constituents are, are, are concerned or have an opportunity or an idea, you know, to attend one of those sessions or write to the commission email uh, or, or snail mail, as they say, to ensure that their uh, input is, is heard. Um, you know, I, to be quite honest with you, I look forward to the opportunity, if it happens, to serve the people in the town of Antigonish um, and as I do uh, other communities. But I can say it's a huge riding. It's going to, it's got to be in the top 20 geographic uh, size ridings. Um, I know my counterpart, Jaime Batiste, his, his riding remained unchanged. And if you look at you know, just as an, you know, an example, you look at uh, Sydney, Victoria, and it's like this. And then you look at Cape Breton, Antigonesh or Cape Breton, Canso, and it's like this. It literally is twice, uh, maybe even three times the size, geographically speaking. But I've made it a um, practice and uh, to ensure that I get around as much as I can, both in person and I'm on Zoom throughout the riding. Uh, to develop relationships, to understand the issues and more or less um, build bonds that are strong so we can achieve what we want to achieve. But, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, it, a large riding, and you could talk to Charlie Angus about this, who has basically Northern Ontario, uh, there are challenges to getting around because you're one person. So what we did was we put together a plan early on in the 2019 mandate of um, our roaming office, um, doing more community Zooms and things of that nature. But it does put miles on you. There's no question about it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I often laugh when I hear uh, people in Toronto, you know, they have a, you know, a two kilometer, three or four kilometer uh, travel. I mean, they're obviously it's condensed population or even Metro Halifax for that matter. You can walk, literally walk from one riding to the next. Yes. Well, you couldn't do that in Cape Breton, Cancel or Cape Breton and, and Ganesh. It would take you, you have to, you'd have to, you'd have to make some sandwiches uh, yes. and, and prepare for a long uh, week or two, but you know, we'll see what, what comes from it. I, I will say this, that um, this is a chance to be heard folks. This is a chance for not just to come in and say, we don't want it. Okay. So what do you want? Uh, and I think that I know, again, just by my experiences on the Provincial Electoral Boundaries Commission, is that there's a couple of things that at least the provincial side weighed, and I think the provincial or federal one would weigh as well, is communities in, of interest, mm -hmm. con historical connections, culture and language. Uh, there's opportunities to be heard, and uh, I think the good men and women on the, on the commission will do just that. I asked this of Justice Cindy Bourgeois when we spoke to her on last week's edition of Tell Ill 24-7, the idea that there was once upon a time a federal riding that took in Antigonish, Guysboro, Inverness, and 
most of Richmond County. Uh, it didn't take in the northern end, but that was the writing of Cape Breton Highlands Canso. And I wonder, from your perspective, is there any kind of appeal to having that historical grouping of those four counties together? I know you've mentioned some concern from the people in Antigonish that they're more traditionally aligned to Pictou County. They were together in Pictou County mm -hmm. for a number of different ridings over the years. But what do you think of the idea of this uh, Cape Breton Antigonish proposed riding could line up with the way the old Cape Breton Highlands Cancel went? I, you know, it's it's highly conceivable as long as it's in the variation, the population ratio. Then, then I think that 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 or like reasonably so. I think there's a variation that can take place as a result of that. But it's an intriguing proposition. You know, I I think that there's opportunities to be creative here, like that, and something like the um, innovation, uh, looking at something innovative and looking at the past uh, in terms of uh, what can be done in the future. I think it's intriguing. That is something worth uh, looking at for sure. Um, you know, there is that connection uh, on Cape Breton, Cape Breton, the Highlands that I think would be exceptionally important. And I think that's the opportunity here, Adam. The opportunity here is to not just, you know, sit around a table and go, you know, I don't like it. I don't like it. Okay, so what can we do? What can we do that will um, hit the points of communities of interest, historical, uh, collateral evidence, uh, natural bonds and connections, um, you know, so that that very well could be applied. I think it's intriguing. I think it should be the, for those that are pursuing it. I give full marks for continuing to pursue it, along with other models that could be advantageous. Um, you know, I am a big proponent of um, following um what the Boundaries Commission will recommend. I have no choice. Um, but I'm also a big proponent, as you know, and your listeners know, of um, everything starts with community. And so does change. So we've been presented recommendations. Let's put forward some other series of recommendations, food for thought, and something that's backed with actual tangible evidence. And so evidence in this case, in this example would be, it was done before. Uh, there's a natural uh, connection via uh, culture. There is a natural connection in terms of uh, commerce, uh, so forth and so on. So uh, very intriguing, and I encourage uh, people to go with it. They will have that chance to be able to speak up. And I note within the public forums that are being held to be able to respond to the Federal Boundaries Commission here in Nova Scotia. There's one scheduled for Sydney. There's one scheduled for Antigonish. Those are the only ones within our immediate area, although there is a virtual session in which people are going to be allowed to speak up as well, too, if they can't attend either of these sessions. Your thoughts on the way that this is all being laid out and the opportunity for people to get involved and make their voices heard? Well, you know, I, I, I can appreciate the logistics behind all of this, um, but I can tell you, um, with due respect to the federal side of things, uh, the federal commission, on the provincial side, um, we traveled up and back and up and back and up and back again uh, in terms of in-person uh, um, discussions, uh, presentations, and things of that nature. So I'm not sure, I can't comment on why there's so few. I can tell you on the provincial side, the benefit of us having the ability to go to uh, Lewisdale, the ability for us to go to Shetty Camp twice. Mm. Um, and in fact, uh, where we received the most people, by far, not even close, was in every rural community in Nova Scotia. Halifax mm. may have been eight people. Mm. <laughs> But in Cape Breton and mainland Nova Scotia, outside of Metro Halifax, there was a genuine interest, a genuine importance, uh, and in some cases concern, in some cases ideas for optimism and moving forward. And, and in fact, um, you know, case in point, uh, the member of parliament for King's Hands, Claude, Cody Blois, was a, yes. uh, at that point, he was, uh, I think, um, just came out of law school. And he was the focal point of gathering the community to push forward through changes that were not the ones that we recommended. And he made a humongous case. And wherever we went, wherever we went, he was there. Being on the Provincial Electoral Boundaries Commission, you, of course, are well aware of the impact that population mm -hmm. advancement or decline plays in determining electoral boundaries. And... 
I wanted to pick up on a comment made by Justice Bourgeois, the head of the Commission for the Federal Boundaries. Uh, she said that the two Cape Breton ridings, uh, Sydney, Victoria, your own Cape Breton, Canso, showed the lowest population of any of the ridings in Nova Scotia that were being considered under the current structure. This coming despite recent increases in the population in the Sydney area in particular, your thoughts on what population means for the redrawing or the proposed redrawing of boundaries for your riding and for the riding of Mr. Batiste, uh, City Victoria next door. Uh, what do you think there? Well, I think that population has a role in the metrics of deciding uh, ridings. However, um, it can't be the only one. Um, it has to be based on, I think, um, I'll take a page out of Mick Kellaway my dad has to be based on some common sense. Um, so there has to be a geographic um, review, meaning how geographically large is this, number one. Uh, there also has to be uh, a distinct nature of, of the language, the culture, um, and the historical ties uh, that our writings share, have in common. Uh, so basically, I think that me- uh, population is a metrics. It can't be the overriding metrics, and it's an important one, but can't be. The other element to this is that, um, you know, I do think that um, with respect to trends, uh, we've seen some trends of, in particular, in the CBRM of increases in population. Now, we have a challenge in rural parts, but the question is, is that, um, and I think it's what rural Canada feels, is that, um, you know, we need strong representation, too. Uh, And we need to uh, think innovatively when we're looking at the decisions that are made and the metrics used to make them. So if you just use population, well, that's an easy, uh, that's, that's a much easy fit. You know, you have a certain percentage of population you have to meet and there's a variation within and boom, you draw the boundaries. But in my experience is that you have to, you know, dig a little deeper and do a little deeper dive in terms of um, the, the realities on the ground, meaning um, the connection to Picto and Anaganesh and the fact that, you know, not only do people shop, but people worship, people go to school back and forth. So there is natural communities of interest that we need to look at. So I would put, in my opinion, I would put them, uh, on par with population. Of course, you, you know, everything, again, we're using the Mick Kellaway rule is within common sense. So, you know, yes. uh, you can't go too crazy on the population side of things. But that said, we have an opportunity now to go back to my, my, my original thought, to look at all the themes here. So when we look at Anaganesh, town of Anaganesh, or we look at Inverness County and Richmond County is... Um, you know, you know, what is the variation that we need to hit? What's the, like the base number in terms of population, but what are the other things that we can bring to the table that show the importance of, of community? And I think that uh, no doubt that will come through, uh, through the Cape Breton Highlands example. I mean, I've had people call me, um, um, in Richmond County, you know, like uh, with their ideas, very much similar to what you brought up. So let's see what happens. And I would say um, these are recommendations, but I've seen recommendations alter based on sound ideas, sound propositions. And uh, I encourage everyone to, um, if you can't be in Sydney, because that's a bit of a jaunt for many people, is you know send your submission to to the commission and i can tell you as a commission member um, provincially i read we we read every single one and debated on every single line all right well we'll hope there's some active participation in the consultation process uh, in the meantime uh, mike kelloway uh, we've covered a lot of ground in a short time as i expect right did you <laughs> want to add anything else about all of this just before we wrap up here just as I said in the beginning, uh, whatever the decision is, you know, whatever decision is made rather uh, from from the commission, we're going to continue to work our backsides off for 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 the people of the riding, um, and I, I think um, that won't change. But again, this is about you. This is about the people of of the the, um, the riding and the people of the town of Andaganesh. If you want your voice heard, you know, get 
in the foxhole and let people know what you think. Let, let them know what you think. But if you have other ideas, if you have other thoughts, don't be shy. Let them know. Let the commission know because they will read it, debate it, discuss it, and you never know what happens. But I can tell you what, what will not happen uh, is uh, your voice won't be heard if you don't project it. We'll hear more from Cape Breton Council MP Mike Kellaway near the end of the show, taking a specific look about whether an Acadian community in Cape Breton could get a new provincial riding in the near future. But for now, let's go back to municipal politics and examine how things are going in terms of the survey process for the pilot project known as Destination Reef Street in Port Hawkesbury. Phone and online surveys were carried out over the past month, However, a couple of town councillors for Port Hawkesbury weren't impressed with the survey process during last week's regular town council meeting at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre. We'll tell you what they had to say in a moment, but first, here's a little background for you. Kickstarted in 2019 as a provincial pilot project, Destination Reeve Street realigned four lanes of traffic into three, with several two-way turning lanes near the entrances and exits to prominent businesses along a one-kilometer stretch of the provincially owned Reeve Street. In March, town councillors approved a request from Nova Scotia's Department of Public Works to cost share a survey that would gather opinions of town residents and commercial business owners about the effectiveness and success of Destination Reeve Street. The plan would see the province picking up three quarters of the survey's $20,000 price tag, with the town responsible for the remaining $5,000. According to Port Hawkesbury CAO Terry Doyle, two weeks of phone surveys wrapped up in the back half of April, while an online survey finished up just last week. But two town councillors, specifically Huey McDougall and Mark McIver, aren't impressed with the methods that narrative research used to carry out the phone surveys in late April. McIver, a volunteer firefighter, claimed that several of his colleagues have registered complaints about the line of questioning used in the phone poll. McDougall claimed to have received several calls on the issue from friends, family, neighbours and constituents. However, despite these councillors' insistence that narrative research officials didn't consult with councillors before formulating their surveys, CAO Terry Doyle, Deputy Mayor Jason O'Coin, and Councillor Blaine McCory felt that the opposite held true. Here's what CAO Terry Doyle had to say about it after last week's regular council meeting at Port Hawkesbury. The survey, both the telephone and online survey, were, were one component of, of a study on the, on the Reeve Street pilot project. The, there was a very conscious decision to hire a professional company uh, and a uh, professional polling company to do that uh, very uh, systematic and, and scientific approach to, to polling. Uh, and uh, there was certainly input uh, into, into polling with the advisory committee to uh, Nova Scotia Public Works with respect to, the, to what we wanted to see achieved uh, the types of questions that we wanted to to uh, to be brought forward. Uh, that committee had input. Uh, that committee reviewed uh, the uh, initial questioning and had uh, asked for additional emphasis on some other items that that, that committee thought were we weren't reaching. Uh, so, so I, I think that was that was a good process. Um, but but again, that process has to be independent. There has it has to be free of bias, and and there has to be a scientific approach to that. And I, and and I believe that that was taken. Uh, but at the end of the day, we'll we'll see the results and and get that analysis from the polling company how things went and what the results were. Whatever people might feel about the online and phone surveys. The resulting data won't be the only information about Destination Reeve Street heading to the province this year. The Public Works Department has also accepted a council request to conduct one final traffic study this coming summer to provide the town with up-to-date figures before it submits its final report on Destination Reeve Street to the provincial government this fall. We shift our municipal focus from Port Hawkesbury over to Richmond County right now. Richmond District 1 Councillor Sean Sampson has an issue with mobile phones entering the council chambers. Here's what he had to say about it during the Committee of the Whole meeting that took place at the council chambers in Arishat on May the 9th. 
I've had an issue uh, with cell phones in this in these chambers, uh, whether it's uh, it's uh, members of the public or people around this table. Uh, to me, uh, no one's ever seen my cell phone. They're not going to see my cell phone uh, for an hour and a half or two hours. We're around this table. I don't think there should be cell phones. Uh, so, I would like to see some kind of uh, discussion or a policy put in place uh, for uh, cell phone use uh, in the council chambers. Thank you. Are so you prepared to I, make a motion on that? Yeah, so I put a motion forward that we refer this to bylaw and policy and, and look into a cell phone uh, cell phone uh, use in the council chambers uh, policy for, for that. Thanks, Councillor Sampson. Yeah. So Councillor Sampson has made a motion uh, to refer the topic of uh, cell phone use in council chambers to bylaw and policy committee. Do I have a seconder on that motion? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Councillor Digdon. Any discussion on the motion? <clears throat> Generally, shut mine off, put it in the bag, but it's not something I'm really concerned about because I think everybody, you know, whether it be public or us sitting around the table, we're all adults here, and I don't know that we have to, like, treat this like a grade five class or anything. I the, I, I mean, you know, I, I guess sitting back and... I think it's personal choice, although I, I don't, I put mine away, but... Oh, no, no, and so, and yeah. so why, uh, Councillor Sampson, but... Uh, I've seen members of the public use it in this room as well, right? So uh, when we had the, uh, the session with uh, Chris McNeil, and we started, he started our day. He started our day with, you know, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. You know, for anybody that's around this table, anybody in council chambers, please sh shut your cell phones off. You know, so I'd like to see something like that. Uh, again, we're all adults, uh, but if there's something in place that says it's prohibited, uh, I'd like to see that uh, go in that in that direction. Okay, so we have we have a motion on yeah. the floor, and so we'll see where that motion leads us, and then we'll either have the discussion in bylaw policy yeah. or we won't. Yeah. In the end, Councillor Sampson's motion did get full council approval at the May 9th Committee of the Whole meeting. So the issue of cell phone use in the council chambers will go to Richmond Council's bylaw and policy committee. This week, two provincial cabinet ministers are sitting down with the executive director for Nova Scotia's only francophone school board. The Conseil Scolaire Acadien Provincial would like to see French language education rights entrenched for all Nova Scotians, and they'd also like to see a bill that recently came forward in the provincial legislature getting signed into law to give the CSEP more autonomy to carry out its mandate. We spoke to the person who brought forward that bill, Liberal Acadian Affairs critic Ronnie LeBlanc, on last week's show. The week before, we got to sit down with Michel Collette, the executive director of the CSAP, to hear his side of the story. Now we're pleased to welcome the Minister for Acadian Affairs et la Francophonie for Nova Scotia. His name is Colton LeBlanc. We reached him at his office in Halifax last week. Here's what he had to say about the CSAP's concerns. And now joining us from his office in Halifax is Nova Scotia's Minister Responsible for Acadian Affairs and for la Francophonie. He is Colton LeBlanc. Minister LeBlanc, thank you for joining us on Till Hill 24-7 today. Good day, it's a pleasure. Well, we wanted to begin by asking you about your experience with the concerns that have been brought forward by the Conseil Scolaire Acadien Provincial, and more specifically with the bill that was brought forward by the Nova Scotia Liberal Party and Claire MLA Ronnie LeBlanc during the recent spring legislature setting. Can you give us a sense of whether you feel that the concerns being expressed at this time are valid concerns? Are they a discussion point for you and your office? Uh, just how do you feel about where things stand right now? No, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the concerns uh, of the CACP uh, are important to understand that have been long on the table uh, since uh, 2018. So it dates back a few years uh, when the previous government uh, abolished the elected school boards, the except the CACP. Uh, and at the time, they, the government of the day had made the promise of, of uh, uh, modernizing the, the Education Act uh, as it pertains to the CSAP and, and some work had been done, um, but not brought forward to the floor of the legislature. So uh, understanding that this is a, a dossier that has long existed and uh, the perhaps for the CSAP, you know, the strong desire to get this done uh, sooner than later. Um, you know, I've, I've had some initial uh, dialogue with them. Uh, early in my in my mandate as Minister of Acadian Affairs and Francophonie, uh, the Minister, Minister Druin as well. And, and our commitment then and their commitment remains now is to, to meet with the CACP and that 
that meeting uh, is, is scheduled for uh, May 19th. So that's uh, next week uh, at the time of, of this interview. And so uh, the commitment remains the, the same as for, for us as a government to, to hear uh, the concerns and to, to collaborate and to understand uh, with the CSAP uh, what needs to be addressed and looked at. Uh, and we look very much forward to that meeting. Now, you spoke just a moment ago about the dismantling of other school boards by the previous Liberal administration, that taking place in 2018. You were elected to your Argyle constituency just a couple of years later, so you've been in opposition before becoming the minister responsible for the Office of Acadian Affairs. Did you get the sense at that time that some of the things that the CSCP are bringing up now in terms of having more autonomy to be able to carry out the protection of French language education for decades to come were in existence before you became a member of the government and a member of the cabinet with this specific responsibility uh, at the time uh, in my time in opposition that there was you know some some discussions uh, taking place with within the previous administration and the CSAP and, uh, and like i mentioned um, uh, those those discussions did not lead to a, a bill being introduced uh, at that time uh, in the legislature by the previous government. And uh, so it was early on uh, in my mandate as Minister of Acadian Affairs that, uh, and, and Franco Funny that uh, I, I started you know, discussions with the CACP uh, to, to hear from them, uh, understanding that this was a, a, a dossier that they want to continue to advance and uh, with, our, with our government. Uh, and, and again, with timelines of, uh, of entering the legislature and whatnot uh, and, and meeting with the minister uh, Mr. Drouin, who's responsible for the file, um, we established that timeline that we'd be meeting in May, um, because understanding it is it is a, a big file, and, and um, you know when you you bring changes to uh, to the floor of the legislature, whether it's it's regarding French education or you know others that I brought forward um, in my time as my other capacities as as minister uh, for Source Nova Scotia, for example. Uh, the impact uh, a vast majority of Nova Scotians, a, a significant part of our, de of our demographics. So I want to make sure you do it right and, and, and uh, you have a fulsome discussion and, and analysis of, of the issues and, and, and again, uh, you know, collaboration with, with the CACP. And of course, uh, part of the minister's mandate letter is working with communities and understanding what the needs uh, and, and desires from communities are. So that's going to be part of, of of the minister's work. Now, I am wondering, Minister LeBlanc, how familiar are you with the bill that was introduced by Claire MLA Ronnie LeBlanc in the latest legislature session? It was a bill that I understand was in the works well before your government took over. It was a collaboration between the Liberal Party and the Conseil Scolaire Acadien Provincial. Have you had a good look at this bill? What do you think of it? I know it's an extensive bill. It's uh, it's, it's quite lengthy. It's uh, you know many, many pages. and. Uh, in both official languages, which is which is great to see. And of course, when we're we're talking about French education, uh, to have uh, that reflected in in both uh, languages. So, understanding there's lots of digest uh, to to digest in that bill. Uh, a lot, uh, you know. There's some questions, of course, and, and again, so uh, we can use that. Uh, we can choose to use that as a reference point in or, or not in in our discussions with the CACP uh, in the weeks ahead. Now, your government has come under fire to a degree from the executive director of the CSAP, Michel Collette. Uh, he has suggested that your government has not given the attention to French language education that is needed. How do you respond to these claims? Is that fair of Mr. Collette to say? My, my commitment to the CSAP, and it's one that you know, it dates to early days in, in, in my position as Minister of Acadian Affairs in Francophonie, is to, to work with the CSAP. And, and again, so uh, perhaps uh, you know, there's some frustration for, for the CSAP that this is a, a dossier that's been you know, ongoing for, for a number of years. It, again, it's you know, the, the fourth anniversary of the abolition of, of, of elected school boards, of uh, Anglophone uh, elected school boards was April 1st. So this is a, a, a dossier that's been ongoing for some time. Uh, so I, I understand and I can appreciate the amount of work and energy that has been uh, dedicated in, into this initiative, into this, uh, this uh, project that they want to see fulfilled. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to support the, the CACP and, and our Acadian Francophone communities and students and teachers uh, to, to see what uh, the next steps are. And those are uh, something that we'll be, of course, including in our discussions with, with the CACP. And as we're winding down here, Minister LeBlanc, of course, Telil Community Television comes from Isle Madame, from Arishat's 
specifically. And I wanted to get your sense on what communication has been like between your office and from Acadian and Francophone community representatives, not just for the CSAP, but from Isle Madame as a whole. Uh, what's been the communication pipeline between your office in Halifax and from us here in Richmond County? The uh, Office of Acadian Affairs and Francophone maintains a, a very close relationship with, with our with our community groups uh, in, in, in many corners of our beautiful province, and, and of course, including uh, the the lead organization, La Fan, La Federation Acadienne de, de la Nouvelle Ecosse. And you know, I, I've wanted to do this uh, many months ago, uh, prior to the latest uh, wave of of the pandemic, but actually to take part in, in a provincial tour. So uh, Richmond is on my uh, on my list. Uh, of course, of course, my my home territory in Argyll. I'm, uh, well established, and you know, with the the needs and the and the folks there. But you know, we're going to be uh, take, uh, undertaking a provincial tour in the in the weeks and months ahead. And uh, for folks uh, in in your neck of the woods, uh, be probably excited to hear that we'll be uh, moving forward with the uh, installation of bilingual stop signs, a project that we're uh, collaborating with with the local municipality. So, and of course, with uh, local MLA. Uh, uh, Trevor Boudreau is a, a great colleague. So looking forward to uh, to getting to to the neck of the woods to to see uh, uh, and and uh, and chat with uh, with the folks in the area. We know you wear many hats and many cabinet positions, Minister Colton LeBlanc. Thank you for joining me on Telil twenty four seven today. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Colton LeBlanc is the minister responsible for Nova Scotia's Office of Acadian Affairs and the minister responsible for La Francophonie. We spoke to him via Zoom from his office in Halifax. Stay tuned for more of Telil 24-7 in just a moment. To wrap things up, we're going to stay with Acadian and French language rights issues for just a couple of minutes. That's because in our conversation with Cape Breton Canso MP Mike Kellaway about federal boundary changes that could be coming, we also got to have a conversation about his time on the Provincial Boundaries Commission and how we came very close to seeing a new riding set up for Shettacamp on the provincial level. So I decided to ask Mike Kellaway a couple of questions about his time on the commission and how close this part of Inverness County came to getting its own protected Acadian riding, just like the one we have here in Richmond. Here is MP Mike Kellaway sharing his thoughts about that time on the Nova Scotia Provincial Boundaries Commission. There are two individuals um, that work for a uh, Atlantic Can Can Canadian Acadian organization, and every single um, Acadian community and the city of Halifax and um, and in Sydney and 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 Richmond and Guysborough County, all counties actually. These two people were, and they made the same presentation mm. over and over again. And we've talked about this before, Adam. Um, you know, the Acadian communities, as recommended, uh, were um, approved. And we came from one vote on the commission. This will stay with me forever because I was pushing for Shetty Camp uh, for its own riding. And okay. one will vote on the commission. Uh, um, cost us the ability to do that. Now, to put it in perspective, though, and this is for people out there in terms, does your voice matter? Does your interventions matter? The times that we went to Shetty Camp, the place was jammed. Presentations were made. Comments were made. Good ones, strong ones. And at first, it was just myself and a gentleman from Shetty Camp on the commission that wanted this and were supporting it. We got more support on the commission as a result of those particular two. Now, we didn't get across the finish line. We got one vote, vote short. And boy, does that haunt me. You know, so close, right? But mm -hmm. we, we came close because of, not because of Mike Calloway or the member on the commission from Shetty Camp, but it was because of the people of Shetty Camp and surrounding areas who made um, an academic, logical, passionate, uh, succinct, presentations now this is purely off our track of questioning for this morning and i don't want to put you in the position of being a federal member of parliament interfering in provincial politics but mm. from where you're sitting right now i know the federation acadienne de la nouvelle Ecosse has put forward a legal challenge to say we want that shed camp riding and they've been at this for many months now from where you're sitting and having had that experience with the Provincial Electoral Boundaries Commission, do you expect that it may be a matter of when, not if, in terms of Shetta Camp getting its own riding? 
Well, I can't speak to the legal matter at hand, but I will say this. Um, there were four of us um, that wrote a letter of dissent in the report. Uh, and the letter of dissent was, we supported the report, but, it, but, but specifically our dissent was with Shetty Camp. And I encourage uh, anybody that wants to read it uh, because we provide the details as to why we believe Shetty Camp and area. Um, so Shetty Camp, Grand Tang, you know, uh, and a few other spots going right down to the, um, going right down to the Marguerite Bridge. Uh, why we believe that it's distinct. It's historical. Uh, there is a, uh, a belief that, um, that uh, it's, it, it, from our perspective anyway, could be accomplished, but be creative and innovative in doing so. And we lay out the steps and we lay out our, our descent. Um, and I suspect, uh, although I haven't talked to the individuals that are putting forth the court case, is that um, that piece of literature in the report probably is uh, being utilized in their, in their court case. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That wraps up this week's edition of Talil 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my interview guests this week, Colton LeBlanc, Aaron McKechn, Terry Doyle, and Mike Kellaway. If you have any thoughts or comments on what you've heard over the past hour, or just some suggestions for future editions of Tell Ill 24-7, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can reach me by email using the address Adam J.R. Cook cook with an e at gmail.com. You can also contact Talil Community Television directly with your ideas and comments. You can reach the station in Arishat by phoning 902-226-1928 and the best email address to use is talil at talil.tv. Don't forget to follow Talil Community Television on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And our YouTube channel features every single episode of Tell Ill 24-7, including this one, as well as individual interviews and stories from our shows and our sister programs Not Cote and Roundtable. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thanks once again for tuning in to Tell Ill 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now. 